Okay, welcome back to the Dyson Sphere program. Um, in this guide, I'll show you how to collect um, deuterium, which is a very late game material, but there aren't actually very good um, normal supplies or very easy normal ways of doing this. Um, you actually, if you use hydrogen which is fairly accessible you need to have a huge number of these particle colliders to actually produce it um, i think they actually seem to have tweaked it it used to be 10 for one and now it's 10 for five which is not bad 10 for five is like a two for one which is also the same for silicon uh, but it's still um, particle colliders are fairly expensive to build in terms of materials and process takes quite a bit of time and the particle colliders take up a huge amount of space on your planet as well. When uh, actually, I don't think I have a deuterium particle collection production chain anymore. I have a, another way. So you can see the second recipe there, the one percent uh, uh, recipe, which is a very different but a very cool recipe, I think. Which is the second thing I'll show you. Um, uh, but let's say that the best way that I found um, to collect deuterium is actually to use a uh, gas giant to collect it and you might have seen like some cases only like 0.04 collectible deuterium and you think like oh that there's no point in actually doing that um, uh, but it's actually pretty effective you need a lot of these um, orbital collectors but the rate of collection is actually about maybe 0.5 per second because there's like some sort of multiplier um, I don't know how that multiplier works but there is a multiplier that these uh, orbital collectors actually have so they collect deuterium faster than it says on the tin of 0.04 I think about 10 times faster but um, once you have a lot of them uh, you can actually fairly effectively uh, collect uh, deuterium from a a gas giant so that's the way that I would recommend to collect um, deuterium but uh, you know this is fairly late game technology um, and you might already have access to hydrogen on your local planet so there's actually another way a pretty cool way uh, two other ways so you can use a particle collider which is an okay way but pretty slow um, so I'm just trying to return back to my home system Gina, not that. Uh, maybe it's on the other side of this planet. Um, I'll keep looking for it. Um, but yeah, so you can use particle colliders, which are fairly slow and takes a lot of space on your planet to uh, to actually, yeah, here we go, to have enough particle colliders to scale the deuterium production. And then there is, uh, I think, a fractal um, process. I, I can't look up the name right now, but it's uh, a warp drive. But that's the one that I'll show you. And if you only have access to hydrogen, that's the way that I would recommend that you actually produce deuterium because it's it's actually a one for one. So you need less hydrogen input and you get more output. Um, it's a little bit less space intensive. Um, and it's a pretty cool production line, um, I would say. But it's a little bit harder to figure out, and it's a little bit different to the production lines that you probably would have been used to uh, building, which I don't think is a bad thing. It's always good to um, try out something different and figure out something different. Okay, let me stop it now. Okay, warp engine. I have to find the planet. I think I just saw a logistics vessel, so let me follow that. But essentially, uh, there's a building. Oh, man. I can have, oh almost went past it. There you go. Um, there's a way where you can just push hydrogen through a building, and there's a 1% chance that it actually produces um, deuterium as output. Which is a pretty cool, pretty cool.
cool production line. It's very unusual, very different. Okay, so this is this is how it works. Now, unfortunately, it's not running. Maybe. Um, can I make it run? Because it's much cooler when you actually see it operating. Okay. Can have a bit of storage here, but at least it's going to start running, which is pretty cool. So. I'll go over here actually to show it off. So the way this works is that you have these fractionators and you just have to run hydrogen into them. And then what happens is that in 99% of cases, it's just going to output the hydrogen this side. But in 1% of cases, and you just saw that happen there, it's going to produce a <coughs> deuterium on this side. And the rate of production really depends on how fast you can pump the hydrogen through the thing. So what I've done in this case is I'm using conveyor belt Mark 3s. So they actually put through, what, 30 hydrogen per second? So about once every three and a bit seconds, there's going to be a deuterium that gets produced. Um, and yeah, so it's a, I think it's a pretty cool production chain. It's very different to having to put stuff in and then wait and then it produces output, but you just sort of blast it through as fast as you can. And um, and then it just outputs deuterium on the other side. So now you might ask me why, uh, or you might notice a little bit of complexity in actually this, this, this system, right? So, um, the thing that you have to work out is that when you put hydrogen in this side, a tiny bit less hydrogen comes out the other side. So this fractionator is going to perform slightly worse than this fractionator because it's going to have 99% of the hydrogen that comes in on this end um, go through that end. Right? So this is a little bit less efficient. You might go, okay, it's only 1%, but... Uh, if we <laughs> follow this around the planet a little bit, you know, after 10 of these fractionators, it's going to be a 10% deterioration in performance. Um, and then after 50, it's going to be a 50% deterioration in performance. So it's, um, it's just compounding over time, right? And the other thing is that depending on the number of fractionators that you actually have, um, you're going to have output, excess out hydrogen output side right so uh, what you need to figure out is how do you actually feed that back into the system now what I've done in this case is that at the end of the chain which happens to be here I just feed it back to the start so this this output belt on the other side of the fractionator just comes around and gets comes back to the start and puts the hydrogen back in the front and then the other thing that I've done here is after every um, fractionator out has processed the hydrogen, um, it actually takes from the return belt and fills up the other the belt going in the other direction back to 100%. So then you don't get a deterioration in the fractionator um, one by one. That's how you get rid of the compounding effect. Now it takes a bit of time for this production chain to actually fully come back to life after it hasn't been operated. But you can see that it's producing um, uh, deuterium at a pretty reasonable rate um, here. It's not quite a full belt and it's pretty hard to, you have to have a hundred of these fractionators deployed to get a full belt, uh, a full Mark III belt or any kind of belt. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's a pretty cool production line, and uh, uh, yeah, it's one of the ways that you can produce deuterium. So, in summary, the two ways or three ways of producing deuterium, the kind of most straightforward and kind of easiest way to do it is to use these particle colliders. There's a recipe for producing deuterium in here. Uh, so you can produce these strange matters, but you can also produce deuterium and particle colliders, but it's a two for one. Um, so two hydrogen produce one deuterium. 
which is a drawback. Then the second way that you can produce deuterium is to actually use these fractionators and just run hydrogen through them on a belt. Then occasionally you get deuterium on the output. Uh, but yeah, the best way that I've found to produce deuterium is actually to collect it from a um, gas giant uh, with quite a lot of uh, orbital collectors deployed. So that's it. Thanks for watching and um, uh, talk to you next time.